You're welcome to First Take on 3FM and TV3. My name is Jifa Bampo. Last time, we were in conversation with the NDC's 2020 running mate, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajiman, where we talked about women in leadership, women, and motherhood. Stay tuned for the continuation of that conversation. You have mothered three children. I think one of the biggest news at the time, you, you know, a lot of the profile came out about you becoming a running mate was that you have three children and they're all PhDs. I was like, wow. But you didn't beat one of my aunts though. She has nine of them, nine PhDs. <laughs> but I was like, that's fantastic. Um, how, how did you do it? I'm sure you've asked your aunt the same question. No, <laughs> I haven't had the chance. <laughs> I oh, you have a chance. You should ask her. <laughs> and actually, it's not in competition with oh, anybody. Just teasing, it's yes. not. In, it's also a conscious effort to say, "Hey, no." It's. It's. I think it's a simple matter of uh, recognizing what young people want to do and supporting them. That. That's all. Was it challenging? You know, because not really, you're, you're, because, because you, are, you you were working as an academic, obviously. You, and then you did other, you were doing other things as well. Listen, even when we think a woman is a housewife, consider the work she does. No, of course, housewife is work too. I'm not disputing. What Wait. I just mean to say so, is you're combining formal work, your no, homework. So I'm trying to make the point that regardless where a woman is, whether you think you're a career or lecturer or whatever, you are always combining many things. Even if you think you're a housewife, you are still combining many things. So it is a standard for working people. And I think by extension, you can say same for the men, but they are not the subjects of, of our, our discussion, discussion right today. now. So yes, it's a question of balance. You know your responsibilities. And I tell young parents that, and I think I've said this in our conversation today, that nobody's a child forever, okay? They will grow. But there are times when they need a lot of you because you have to do a lot of things for them. They can't do it for themselves. They can't change themselves. They, they get cranky when they want to sleep. And you know, I've always wondered why that is the case. Why do they cry so much when they just want to <laughs> sleep? But you know, that is it. So you just give them that time. And there'll be many times for you I think a lot of the challenges some of us face is to combine too many things at the same time. And then definitely something will suffer. And I pray and hope that there's a child who is not suffering. So yes, they will grow. Uh, as a parent, they'll need you all the time. But they'll need you for different things at different stages in their lives. How can us younger women uh, improve on our work life <laughs> balance because sometimes it's as if you're, you're engrossed in, in this work you're trying to deliver. You're at home trying to be the best mother there is. You're trying to be a good daughter, uh, a good aunt. It just seems sometimes so much. And then yes. of course you have to deal with the uh, urban traffic, urban living. Yes, um, but sometimes we have to make choices. They may be difficult, even painful choices, but we need to make them. So you have a child, you live in the urban area, there's traffic, there's my work, and you need to decide at every stage, what's my priority? Right now, what can wait? What cannot wait? It's not everything that cannot wait. Something will have to wait, and you need to have that heart to make that decision. And it also depends on you as a parent what your own priorities are as far as your family is concerned. So if you know that, oh, you have two children, they're under five and so on and so forth, uh, maybe I'm not going to take a job yet that requires me to be at work for 16 hours. As they grow, you can work 24 hours and it will be okay. So you see, it's a question of adjustment. And I'm making it sound so easy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I know, I know it is not. Let me use myself as an example. Joining the faculty. And those days so much emphasis on women in consultancy, women in this. And I had lost my mother earlier. I had three children. I decided I had a home to run. 
I decided there were things I wanted to do myself for my children. And therefore, fellowships and so on, I wouldn't even apply. Okay? Because I didn't know how I was going to leave my children for a year or two going abroad. Although the fellowship, yes, maybe it would have been near to me, maybe I would have had my promotion earlier, but at what cost? I remember particularly when the universities were being encouraged to set up consultancy units. And I teamed up with a colleague of mine, the university appointed us to set it up. And it went well. And so the UNDP wanted, was more or less offering uh, me a position, meaning that I had to leave the university and come to Accra. Yes, the money looked good compared to what I was getting. <laughs> it looked very, very good. But here I am with young children. Where am I going to live in Accra? Where will my office be? Where will my home be? When do my children have to wake up? Uh, if they get to school tired and sleepy, in the end, what would I have gained? And uh, you know, the campus is a very sheltered community. Yes, the kids walk to school and come back. Uh, my office is a walk. If my car breaks down, I don't have a problem. So it's a question of weighing uh, your options and making your decision. Later on, the consultancies will come. You know, the fellowships, they'll come so often, you may not even know which one to take. The doors will open. But it's a question, I think, for myself. This is not an advice mm -hmm. for anybody. All I'm saying is that it's a question of, of uh, weighing your options, setting your priorities. At every given time, the priorities may change because so, mu so much has also changed in your life. And you just go for it. But I think that combining too many things at once can be a huge challenge. And in the end, you may suffer, others may suffer, you know, too many. It's, it's the proverbial statement of looking uh, through, um, looking through two bottles with one eye. So in the end, you don't see anything. Mm -hmm. So yes, you have to realize some things can wait, some things cannot wait. Children will not wait. They will keep growing. And when they are 10, they don't need the attention they would have required at two or three. And sometimes making up for that lack of attention can take a lifetime. Okay, so it's an individual no thing. Decision. Yeah. Um, in terms of the areas of empowerment for Ghanaian women, um, what do you think should be our areas of empowerment? On the campaign trail, there was an image I always used. And that was the image of water. And I use the image of water to show how infrastructure is important and how it can affect everybody's life. So let's take water. And let's say that the water source is about a mile or two away from your home. And in the morning, if it's not the woman of the house, it's normally the girls. The boys also fetch water. But I know that on the average, it's the girls. So a girl goes and fetches two, three, four times in the morning before she gets to school. The likelihood of getting to school on time is very low. So she's likely to get to school late. She's, and by the time she gets to school, she's going to be tired. So the likelihood of getting an attention span of high quality is also very low. She may even fall asleep. So when you look at the performance of girls, and then you are telling us, oh, they are not doing so well, they are not doing so well. I don't think it's because they are not capable of doing well. There's something else that needs fixing. It may just be the water. Do you get it? So you, we want everyone to do well. We need to ensure that the basic things are available to everybody. And that is why development is important those things that some of us take for granted because we are in the big cities may be a reason why somebody is not making good progress. So that's one. Sometimes it is also the economic activities of the mother in the sense that I 
you know, let's say that I sell bread or I make donuts for sales. Again, I know the boys also sell, but generally the girls who sell. So just like fetching the water, she may be late to school. But then you see, the mother doesn't have the strength to do all of that and also go and hawk the donuts. So somebody must help. And that person or those people are the children. And most of the time, that kind of labor falls on the girls. So you see, you see how it adds up. And you can also cite many, many other examples. So if this is the situation, then girl is not very likely to be very alert in school. Not because she can't. There's a lot of burden on her. Right. So it can be the economic responsibility of the parents. It can also be the biological responsibility of the parents. I'm not sure how many little boys you see carrying babies, sometimes bigger than themselves. <laughs> It may be the girls. They are the ones minding little brother or little sister. That's all. It is good. It's good training. But if it's going to get in the way of her schooling, if it's going to get in the way of other forms of expression, then there's a problem. So it can be the biological responsibility. It can also be just family responsibility. We like to bring our older people closer to us. So, and most likely, it is girl who will be asked to go and check out grandma. And if grandma is ill and mother has to sell or do something, it is very likely that it is girl who may stay at home to mind grandma instead of going to school. So you see, the problem is multifaceted and it has to be tackled on many, many things. It's not a matter of simply throwing money at us. Yes, we need the money too, and they should increase it. But I'm saying that it's not the only solution. It's mainly about the kind of uh, structure and precisely, policy that precisely. we have. Precisely. So you see, just to remind you a little bit of the reason why we thought um, even maternity leave needed to be extended. Extended. That was reason. one of the NDC's policies. Yes. And, and, you know, every so, oh, she, she was with us, she went to deliver, and, you know, we had bad news. I'm not saying that is the only reason. That would be totally wrong. You know, the, the decision for a young woman to decide to have a baby can be a stressful one, especially for the career people. You've already talked about time and all of that, and now she's going to grow a baby in her. And a lot of them end up not even taking their year's leave because they know that... They need the extra time to add on to maternity wonderful. leave. So what happens? What happens is that this young lady, who is growing a baby in her, has not rested. By the time she gets to that labor ward, where she needs all that energy in the world, she's already exhausted. And if she's also going to have to leave a tiny baby in the care of somebody, her own mind at work may not be fully engaged at work. So you see, there are many reasons why for us as women, we don't go as fast as, yeah, the babies are important and we want them to have the babies. But we also need to find ways of uh, supporting this wish that we all have for our young ladies. So yeah. in, in looking at the efforts women make generally, um, when COVID-19 hit, a lot of women were impacted. Some. Uh, had to probably cut back on their job because they needed to be home. Since the children were home the majority of the time, uh, ways of working changed for many. They have to now work from home, some lost incomes and the like. I'm sure you may have had thoughts about, you know, the impact of COVID-19 on women. Yeah. How can we get out of, you know, the devastation it has brought? You see, uh, COVID-19, when a society is impacted neg negatively, it is impacted everywhere. Everybody suffers. We suffer too. But normally, it is those at the bottom who suffer most. And we are the ones at the bottom. You see? Uh, people couldn't sell food in the streets. Who sells food in the streets? People couldn't go to the market and sell. Who dominates the markets? 
even in the health facilities, counting nurses and doctors, who, you know, who forms a majority of nurses, maybe not doctors, but of nurses, definitely, and maybe of the cleaners and so on and the so forth. The healthcare professionals. So they are also at risk. So, so many things did not work in our favor. And those in the corporate world, now working from home, have you always worked from home? Do you have training working from home? If you have a young child, all he or she knows is that you are home. Because normally when you are home, hopefully a bit more of your time is for this child than for other things. If you get home and your child is crying, you're not going to leave your child and say, I'm going to cook. You pick the child, console it, make him feel or her feel loved, and then you can do other things. Now you're at home, what are you telling this four-year-old that I'm working from home? So you see, there were all those stresses that uh, we didn't anticipate. No one called COVID-19. It came on its own, and then it came with all these uh, difficulties. So, the, but the it, it's also opened our eyes to some of the things we ought to be paying attention to. It's so, brought new ways of working, new ways of doing things. How can women leverage that then? to yes. bring off their best and also so, support you see, themselves it, and their family. It was family. a pandemic of a different kind. So you couldn't send that child to the daycare so you could work at home. Okay? So if it's, it's created new ways of working, then we need to take daycares very, very, very seriously. Maybe more so than we were doing before. But when it's a pandemic, it's a serious matter. Mm -hmm. And so we cannot insist on the things we want to do because our companies need to make profit. Okay, we need to put the human life first. And then we are just slowly, slowly the women will come. But you also know that there are many people who live from hand to mouth. And if that one day she doesn't rose the plantain, if that one day she doesn't sell the pure water or whatever else, it's a huge challenge for them. So we need to think of our social protection measures and take them very, very, very seriously. Even as we try to raise everybody maybe above the minimum wage. And how about those who don't even have a wage, let alone a minimum one? So I think it's thrown many, many things into relief. It's thrown education into relief. We had all those computers and our practice was to go to school and use the computers. Now, hopefully, will think of how else to use that computer away from the school so that uh, no one anticipates any tragedy for us. But it has shown that we can do things a little bit differently. Are you, you talk about education and doing things differently. Now we see a lot of online education, uh, teaching via television for students. I mean... Is that a good way forward? A lot depends on the curriculum. A lot depends on the training. A lot depends on the design. And a lot depends on the output. A lot depends on how you have prepared that child to learn from the screen instead of hearing a teacher. So as I said, it's thrown many things into relief. And we need to look very, very closely where our gaps are and then train differently or modify our training. Mm -hmm. If people are going to learn on their own how to do evaluation, how to ensure that the person is truly learning. I hear of situations where parents are doing the homework of their children. If parents are doing that, please, you are not helping. Uh, you are not supposed to do it for them. You are supposed to guide, just ensure they're doing it. So yes, they didn't get 10 over 10, but that's their effort. I used to tell my students that you know, uh, the students have patience with are the ones that will get a C, but that is what they can do. They've put in the best, that's what it is. I respect for that. The ones I don't have patience for are the ones that I know can get an A, but they are happy with the C plus. You know, they will have a little fight or a little conversation about how you shouldn't be wasting all this uh, opportunity and the effort that I know you can bring to bear on this assignment, you know. So um, the parents should ensure the children do their homework. And really, what is homework? Homework means I've taught it. 
and I want to know, do you remember it? Can you apply it? Homework doesn't mean it's a new topic. Go and let your parent teach you. Your parent is not a teacher. So the parent's own method will be very different from what the teacher's method is. Or the private teacher's method may be very different from the parent's method and may be different from the teacher's method. In the end, you may be confusing this child. Let me use my own example. When one of my children, name withheld, was having a bit of difficulty with math. To think that he grew up and then math was the only subject he liked anyway. And I think it was division. So I decided to help. So I said, oh, you know, you can do this and you subtract this and it's carry forward, forward this mm -hmm. and so on. And so he did it and went to school. So when he came back the following day, I asked, ah, so how did that go? So parents also follow up, find out. So how did that assignment go? I said, you know, my teacher said it's a very old way of doing maths. Mm. That was the last mm. time, time you made an effort uh, at teaching at maths. that particular <laughs> subject. You know, so much as you have the good will and sword, we need to be a bit more restrained and not to confuse the child. Mm. Yeah. Now, let me move away from the education bit to just a bit about the economy, because one of the things that women tend to be affected about generally uh, is about the economy. COVID-19 has impacted our economy generally, their efforts to recover. Um, for women, I, I got an earful uh, recently on social media when I posted that we women now have to pay so much for gas. And I was told it's not just the women who are buying gas. How can we be more resourceful? How can we, um, should I say, do things beyond just what we normally know so that we can improve oh. our economic circumstances? Well, let me say that women have been improving over the years. And we need to encourage all of us to keep improving. So, um, but as I said, we also tend to be at the bottom of things. So we need to support programs that raise our status, you know, in the economy. Women, women contribute a lot to the economy. Look Actually, the in, in, in fact, in Ghana, most small businesses are owned by women. Yes, but then you see, when the... I don't want to go into too many details, but I just want to say that, yes, so many of us are in the small-scale businesses, and if... Um, our creation, our creativity is not patronized. Let's say I'm making soap, okay? And I'm going to compete with others who have also made soap elsewhere and it's advertised and so on. And if I don't get the support I need, uh, maybe nobody will buy my soap or it will not go as quickly as I think it should, okay? Um, in order to support women, we know what we should do. Uh, it's not a new subject. We know what we should do. If they are small-scale businesses, what type, what are the margins, do they get any profit? All that heat in the sun, at the end of the day, how much do they make, and so on and so forth. And, of course, it goes for the men too. Sometimes we forget that there are also many, many men in that small-scale business. I see them in the streets too. And you also wonder, at the end of the day, how much do they make? So it is a question of taking a holistic view at our economy, at the contributors to the economy, at the private sector, at the public, at all the sectors, and um, ensuring that we can even consume, let's say half, if we, can, if we can produce half the things we are consuming, I'm sure it will trickle uh, everywhere and people will be happier. And as we wrap up, um, many young women will be looking ahead to 2024. I know it's early, uh, but I remember when you were outdoors, a lot of uh, women on social media were excited. Uh, they were rooting for you and the like. Still going to be in politics? I want to thank all of them. Many, many more who were not on social media. Old ladies I met on the campaign trail. I remember one woman with her walking stick just pushing through the crowd. And I remember telling my security people to bring her forward. And she came, she just said, God bless you. And I want to remember her on Mother's Day. And I want to say, God bless her. Going forward is one step at a time. 
Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor <laughs> Jane. Well, I understand you like it. Nana no, Jane, isn't it? They are all my names. All right, so I'll call it anyhow. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nana Jane Pukwajiman. Many thanks for speaking to First Take. It's been